what I want to talk about for the next few minutes is whether or not there's something going forward as, as society develops and comes out of the pandemic, whether we can see about reorganising society's approach to sleep schedules and individuals within society's approach to sleep schedules to improve all of our lives and to improve society as a whole. And I guess one, possibly the only positive thing that's come out of the pandemic is that we've learned a little bit to cope with flexibility and to, to learn new ways of working. And maybe going forward, we can apply that um, more broadly than just in relation to, to the pandemic. So when we talk about organising our sleep schedules, what do we actually mean and how could we do that? How could we improve our sleep schedules? There's two basic aspects of that. One is circadian rhythmicity. Now, circadian just means something that changes on a 24-hour cycle. So if you look at the activity of a tree, it will have changes over the light-dark cycle, as you might expect. So when it's light, the leaves open up and, and the cells become active. And that's one aspect that we share with all living organisms. So every living organism and every cell within every living organism has these changes in activity over 24-hour periods, this circadian variability, circadian rhythmicity. You can see it in jellyfish, you can see it in cats, you can see it in humans. We're all basically sharing the same mechanisms, and some of the genetic mechanisms for this are well understood and are conserved across different species and, and all the way from plants upwards, and this is relatively well understood. One thing that affects what we're talking about today is that we all have an intrinsic preference. And what we're talking about here is the preference for when we're going to be more active and less active over the 24-hour cycle. Some of us like to be active early and go to bed early. Some of us like to be active late and go to bed late. And then there's a bunch of us in the middle who are intermediate. And that's going to become important when we start to see what we can do about optimising people's sleep patterns and also about how society impacts on this and how particularly the nine to five societal day impacts on people's sleep schedules. The other side of what we mean when we want to optimise people's sleep schedules is sleep itself and how can we achieve better sleep and achieve the amount of sleep that we need. And I guess it's probably worth us defining what we mean by sleep. I would see sleep as a reorganisation of brain activity. So if you look at this, um, this picture here, you've got these different coloured brain regions. When we're awake, the way the brain works is that all, of, all different regions are interacting with each other to perform the tasks that we need to perform when we're awake. When we fall asleep, that activity doesn't drop off. It, it's not like bra uh, the brain shuts down when we fall asleep. The brain reorganises itself. So the way in which these regions interact changes when we fall asleep and as we go through the deeper stages of sleep. And that's really what we mean by sleep. And in a way, although we define sleep behaviourally and we know that we're cut off from the environment and we know that we're, we're not the same, we're not, we're not experiencing the same thing when we're asleep, that really comes out of this reorganisation of brain activity. And this becomes important because all of the functions that the brain supports are impacted by the amount of sleep that you have. And if you, in, if you don't get enough sleep, cognitive functions, things like memory, attention, any kind of complex interaction with the world will be adversely affected. And you'll probably know this yourself. At some point, you have been sleep deprived, almost certainly. If you've got small children, you're probably still, still sleep deprived. You cannot do complex tasks in the same way that you would be able to do if you were well rested. And, and a clear example of that is driving. So if you take nothing away from, from my talk today, it's important not to drive when sleep deprived because you achieve the same level of impairment after maybe about 24 hours of sleep deprivation of, of not having had sleep as you would by having alcohol at the drink drive limit. And most of us would think twice about driving at the drink drive limit, but would you think twice about driving when you've not had as much sleep as you should have done and as you know that you need? It's going to impair your performance. It's going to lead you to have more likelihood of accidents. Another aspect that is important is, is the way in which we interact with the world emotionally. And again, you, you may have noticed this yourself, that when you are tired, when you are sleep deprived, you will respond angrily, you will be less likely to be able to cope with the things that the world um, flies at you. 
And that's because your whole emotional regulation system is impacted by that lack of sleep. And you're not, you become more likely to respond strongly to negative stimuli and less likely to respond positively and strongly to positive stimuli. So something negative becomes important. The positive aspects of it become lost along the way. And this really has been suggested to underpin some of the links between sleep and mental health, particularly things like depression, where the link is relatively clear and it's suggested that a period of sleep deprivation or insomnia can come before a period of depression. And there are studies out there that have tried sleep interventions to improve people's sleep as a way of helping people cope with depression. But across the board, I mean, if you look at pretty much any mental health problem out there, then you will find that there is a sleep aspect to it. Maybe more important, maybe less important, but there will be something there. It's not just the body because, it's not just the brain, sorry, it's the body as well. All of your hormonal regulation needs a proper amount of sleep and there's, there's links there suggested between weight gain and obesity and diabetes if you have poor quality sleep. Because again, you may have noticed this, if you stayed up all night, in the morning, you're, you, or after your long period without sleep, you seek calorie rich food, you become hungry, you seek foods that are calorie rich and that potentially lead you to weight gain, that comes from the fact that your hormonal regulation has been perturbed. This has a cost to society as a whole. It has a cost to individuals, but overall it has a cost to society, which has been suggested in the tens of billions of pounds per year. So if we want to improve that, what can we do? Well, on the one hand, we can try to play with people's timing of sleep so that they achieve sleep at the time that is best for them. Or we can try and play around with the duration of people's sleep so that they get the right amount of sleep for them. Ideally, we'd want both of those to be occurring. We have this third factor coming into this, which is the nine to five societal day, which imposes some limits on what we can do currently. We have another um, factor or a thing worth bearing in mind when we try to, to improve people's sleep. You can't really train people to have less sleep. If you as an individual work on seven or eight hours sleep, as most people do. If you get six hours sleep, you're just going to be impaired. And you're not going to be particularly good at judging how impaired you are. And the studies of long-term sleep deprivation where people feel as if, if you asked them, they'd say, yes, I know I'm not at, at top, uh, performing as I would like to, I know I'm tired, but after a few days, they think it's, it's got about as bad as it's going to get. Whereas if you test them objectively, it just carries on getting worse. So people are not good at judging how impaired they are. So if we want to improve sleep patterns, we can't really get people to sleep less very easily. But what we can do is play with their timing of sleep to make sure it fits with the societal day or to make sure the societal day fits in with their sleep patterns. So let's have this as a representation of our activity over a few days, where when it's light, we tend to be active. When it's dark, we tend to be sleeping. Let's take someone who has a late sleep pattern. Someone who might go to bed at three o'clock in the morning. Ideally, that would be the pattern that they would follow. Their genetics are pushing them that way, but also their behavior is pushing them that way. Those people particularly are at risk of negative impacts because if they follow a nine to five working day, they're almost certain not to get the amount of sleep that they need. If you want to go to bed at three o'clock in the morning, but you have to get up at eight o'clock in the morning, you've only got a five hour period for sleep and that's pretty much not enough for anybody. So we've got two ways of helping those people who have those late sleep patterns and that will have a knock on effect on the negative impacts we've seen associated with sleep deprivation. We can try to help them to shift to a, a period that is better and have more alignment between their preferred schedule and the societal nine to five day. And we did a study a couple of years ago where we took some students who were following their natural schedule. They were, they were late type students. They wanted to go to bed three o'clock in the morning, something like that. And we helped them to shift so that they'd go to bed maybe at one o'clock in the morning rather than three o'clock in the morning. You can't take someone who wants to go to bed at three o'clock in the morning and shift them so they go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. That's, there's limits to how much you can work with this. But you can help people to shift a little bit just by getting them to focus on the timing of their sleep and the timing of their activities as well, like eating and exercise. When we did that and we helped them to shift more in alignment with the nine to five societal day that they were being asked to follow, 
they had improvements in their mental health, so we, we assessed them for depression, anxiety, and stress. We assessed them for their cognitive performance on working memory and attention tasks. All of these things improved when they were more in alignment. They were getting better sleep, they felt better, and their objectively, their mental health and their cognition was better. They also felt less tired, as you might expect. The other option, though, is to allow the societal day to have more flexibility so that those people can follow more like their natural pattern, but the societal day doesn't impact on them. So if you go to bed at three o'clock in the morning, you want to have eight hours sleep, maybe you don't start work until midday and you finish later, and then the societal day, what your expectation is in terms of your work, is able to accommodate you and your natural rhythm. And there are studies out there that have done that, and, and particularly around the timing of school days, to try and shift them a little bit later so that children are not getting up quite so early in the morning. And this is particularly important for young people. So going through childhood and adolescence and into young adulthood, you tend to go through a period of shifting later. And any of you who've got teenagers, they tend to want to go to bed quite late. And that's kind of a very common process as, as they develop that they tend to want to follow this later schedule. So if really, if we can do something here, we can help younger people to, to cope with the day that they have to um, face before them, but also have better mental health, better cognition. So we've got these three different aspects. We've got our circadian rhythms. We know we can, as an individuals, change what we do, and we can, we can shift off our patterns within reason, and maybe individuals themselves can do that and we can help them to fit in a bit better with the day. We can't really force people to have shorter sleep durations, so we're always going to be limited by that in terms of how long people sleep. And particularly if, you, if you're someone who likes 10 or 11 hours sleep, then you know, you've got a fundamental problem. It's going to be very difficult to cope with that. And there are some people who do like, who do need that amount of sleep. Not many, it tends to be around about seven or eight hours is the most common, but there are people who need longer. So then this final factor of the societal day and how that fits in, how that constrains what we're able to do in terms of modifying people's sleep patterns and allowing them to achieve what they want to achieve and therefore allowing them to have optimal performance and, and feel as good as they can do during the day. These are the aspects we've got to work with. Really, if we can take a two-pronged approach of taking people who have particularly the late patterns who are most impacted, giving them some advice maybe about how they could shift a little bit earlier because it, it does help them and they do, they do feel the benefit for that, but also allowing as a society a much more flexible approach to the working day and to the expectations that are on individuals to time their day. Why do they need to time their day to this average nine to five that fine is okay for a lot of people but isn't good for other people? Is there any real reason why as a society we absolutely need to impose that on everybody even though it doesn't fit them very well? If we're able to do that then we've got all of these benefits. We've got benefits to the individual a lot of benefits across the board. If you are living your life not achieving the amount of sleep that you would like to achieve, then you are going to be impaired pretty much across the board. There is, as far as I know, I don't think there's any function or any process within the body that improves with poor quality or short duration sleep. Everything gets worse. So if you're able to impact on people, if you're able to help them to achieve the sleep that they need, you're in a good position for those individuals, you're in a good position for society, because the individuals within society are able to actually achieve what they want to achieve. They're going to be more productive, they're going to be more happy, they're going to be less likely to suffer from poor mental health, poor cognitive and, and physical outcomes. There's really no losers in any of this. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening.